Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for braving the Arctic conditions to be here. Uh, sleep and dreams are things you will have done quite a bit of in your life. Uh, in fact, you spend about a third of your life in sleep and roughly 20% of that dreaming, even if you don't remember having done so. Now, it was extremely difficult to study sleep because you don't learn much from uh, watching a recumbent person. Not much point in giving them a questionnaire when they wake up because they don't remember much of what happened. Uh, the breakthrough came with the discovery of um, monitoring electrical activity of the brain, the EEG, or popularly known as brain waves. And it, what it revealed was uh, that the typical sleep pattern looks something like this. You start off when you're awake, you, your brain is in what is called alpha rhythm, sometimes a bit of beta, which is a slightly more active form. But as you go to sleep, the brain waves become slower and uh, a little bit more uneven. And you, you go through a, a phase, the deepest part of sleep, where the least uh, activity is occurring in the brain, seems to be about one hour after you put your head on the pillow. So stage four is commonly known as deep sleep. But then you, shortly after that, you get a period in which uh, the eyes are moving underneath the closed eyelids, particularly left and right. And that's called rapid eye movement. And it signals a different kind of sleep where the brain is, uh, is apparently very much awake. You still look as though you're asleep to a casual observer, but there's a lot going on inside your brain, um, including the likelihood of dream. And that is called rapid eye movement sleep. And there are several uh, phases of it, four or five in the course of, of the night, getting progressively longer as you get closer to the morning. And uh, they are particularly interesting parts because uh, if you wake a person as they are in the phase of REM sleep, they usually report that they have been experiencing a dream. Uh, dreams may occur in other phases of sleep, but much less reliably so. There are other things that are interesting occurring in uh, stage two sleep, particularly uh, what are called sleep spindles, we will see that they have some special significance shortly. Now, REM sleep is something that uh, all mammals have. You don't see very much of it in reptiles. There are fleeting examples of it in birds. But all mammals have, have REM sleep, uh, particularly predator animals. And uh, a lot of research is done with cats because they do a lot of sleeping. If you've ever had a cat, you'll know that. And uh, their sleep patterns are, um, and the alternation of orthodox sleep and REM sleep seems to be very much uh, typical of the human pattern. You can tell when a, whoops, sorry, when a, a cat is in ordinary orthodox sleep, uh, it tends to look a bit like that. When it's in REM sleep, the limbs are, uh, lose all muscle tone and it looks as though you could pick it up and drop it from a, a great height and it would uh, you know, end up in that sort of position. So uh, you can tell when your cat is probably dreaming <laughs> because all of the limbs are spread out and totally relaxed. Now, it's interesting to speculate as to why predator animals uh, should sleep more and have more REM sleep. Uh, the possibility is that, um, A, they can afford to, because um, grazing animals have to spend a heck of a lot of time awake and chewing grass or whatever. Uh, predator animals have a, one, one decent meal that might last them for two or three weeks and the rest of the time they can spend sleeping, so they don't have to. Um, the other suggestion is that prey animals uh, need to keep an eye out for the possibility of a predator. There's a nice little 
Woody Allen quote that sort of illustrates that. The lion and the lamb shall lie down together, but the lamb won't get much sleep. A lot of truth in that. Uh, sleep does seem to be important. All animals do it, including the, um, the aquatic mammals like dolphins. But interestingly, uh, because they, say they seem to need sleep, but they also have to be awake because they have to breathe. They are conscious breathers, unlike ourselves. So they solve that problem by sleeping the two hemispheres separately. Uh, one, one side of the brain sleeps while the other is awake. And the eye that is open is the one that is opposite the, the side of the brain that is awake. Now, one of the reasons we know that people need sleep, and it's a bit of a mystery as to why, why they do, um, some people have said there is no function of sleep, that it's some kind of an evolutionary hangover, that it's better to sleep um, when it's dark to save tripping over things or becoming more obvious to other predators. But uh, it's almost certainly got a more direct and important function than that. Now this chap, called Randy Gardner, volunteered as a school project, would you believe, back in the 1960s, to, to go without sleep for as long as he could. He lasted 11 nights, and they observed that he became progressively uh, disorientated, and uh, his speech became blurred, uh, or slurred, vision blurred. Uh, he became ill-tempered began to develop delusions and hallucinations. Uh, when he was finally allowed to sleep, um, he did a little catch-up. That is, he slept an extra, um, what, seven hours on the first night, a couple of hours extra on the, on the second too. So he made up a certain proportion of his sleep, but uh, he made up only 11 hours sleep, having lost 90 and didn't seem too much the worse for wear after that. Um, so some people concluded from that well, that sleep isn't all that important. It's quite hard to observe the detrimental effects of sleep. Um, interestingly, he made up more of the stage 4 deep sleep and the REM sleep compared with other phases of sleep, as though they are uh, particularly important aspects of sleep. But um, one shouldn't suppose that losing sleep is harmless because if uh, rats are deprived of sleep, uh, whereas they would normally live two or three years, they are lucky if they live two or three weeks if deprived of sleep. What is important about sleep? Well, it seems that neurodevelopment uh, is an important aspect of it. Um, your tissues are being repaired, your immune system is being uh, bolstered. Um, REM sleep may be particularly important for neurodevelopment because the younger you are, the more REM sleep you have. Uh, so that um, the neonate, newborn, um, has uh, something like 50% of their sleep is REM. And uh, it appears that REM sleep actually starts earlier than that in the womb, back to about 30 days into pregnancy. A fetus will be exhibiting REM sleep. So it goes back uh, quite a long way into development. And the, the younger that you are, the more your brain is developing, the, the more important REM sleep seems to be. Um, other aspects of sleep are uh, very important for memory storage, memory consolidation. And there are a number of uh, experiments that demonstrate this. I mentioned sleep spindles. They, that is a very rapid little burst of electrical activity that occurs particularly in stage three. Um, sorry, stage two. There, there's a couple of spindles. And stage two sleep, we spend uh, about half of our night at that, at that level. And a number of studies have shown that um, these sleep spindles seem to be associated with the transfer of uh, daily experiences from a short-term storage capacity, which is probably the hippocampus in the brain, 
to a kind of a hard drive which is represented in the prefrontal cortex. And uh, the studies of Mander and colleagues seem to show that you need to have sleep to transfer the material from the hippocampus to the prefrontal uh, lobes in order that the hippocampus is now available for um, further storage. It's, it's like sort of downloading pictures on, on, your, um, on your digital camera into your computer so that you've got more room left in the camera to take down some new experiences. Our sleep cycle uh, is controlled by oscillators in uh, an area of the brain called the suprachiasmic nuclei, which are in here, the hypothalamus, two tiny little um, concentrations of cells. They're, they're about the size of a pinhead and a pair of them, packed with, with neurons. And they are located, uh, suprachiasmic means, uh, above the area where the visual input crosses on its way to the opposite side of the brain. So they are very handy uh, for the visual input and can therefore monitor the amount of light that uh, is coming in from the environment. And uh, via a rather strange detour through the spinal column, they influence the amount of melatonin that is being secreted from the pineal gland that some people think of as an ancient uh, evolutionary third eye in the brain which uh, monitors the time of day. And uh, more melatonin is produced when it is dark, which is why melatonin, of course, has been used directly as a, a cure or a treatment for, uh, uh, for insomnia. There is a, a second biological clock in the pons, which is in the brain stem, uh, and that is, works on a, on a kind of a 90-hour oscillation, hour and a half, and uh, is what um, stimulates the REM sleep cycles. Now, of course, uh, the day-night cycle is affected by jet lag, uh, particularly if you're traveling on a very fast airliner from east to west or vice versa. It doesn't affect you so much if you go due south to Cape Town or somewhere like that. Um, shift work will also obviously interfere with your day-night cycle. And uh, it has been found that, you, uh, that if uh, a person is put in a bunker, which is totally dark, they don't know what time of day it is, their clock tends to run towards a 25-hour cycle as though you're waiting for it, waiting for the sun to come up. And if, if that doesn't happen, then you say, to hell with it, I'll go to sleep anyway. Um, but it's been found that uh, because of that um, tendency for the 24-hour cycle to slip towards a 25-hour cycle, if you have no information as to whether it's light or dark outside, uh, shift work is very much better organized so that when you change your shift, you're going clockwise. That is, uh, you are starting work at a later time each time your shift changes. So suppose you have shifts that's eight hour, three eight-hour shifts starting at 8 a.m., um, 6 p.m., is it? Uh, 8 a.m., 8, uh, 4 p.m., <laughs> and uh, midnight. Then, then you're better uh, running the, the changes in the shifts clockwise so that uh, if you, your last shift was at um, 8 a.m., the next one should be 4 p.m., and, and so it goes on. For a long time, uh, you, you know this came because um, the, the factories like to be operating 24 hours, so you have to have different people operating uh, three shifts. And uh, for a long time in America, they had them running backwards, so that every time somebody... Um, changed their shift, they, they would uh, have to wake up earlier, and that turned out to be much more stressful than rotating them clockwise. Now, something else that in, whoops, interferes with the daylight cycle is northerly migration. 
If, uh, if humans evolved about a million years ago, we only got into North Europe at about um, 100,000 years ago, probably. And um, this will have had an effect on the circadian rhythm, the sleep cycle. And there are some historians that reckon that they have evidence that um, we used to, our ancestors used to sleep two shifts in the night. That is, they slept twice with a, an hour of activity between the two of them. Um, I don't find the evidence for that totally compelling, but it is possible that they did that more in winter, where you have long winter nights in northern climates, uh, and maybe needed to break them up a bit. And it may be uh, the equivalent of the Spanish siesta in the long summer days, where you break the day in half by having an hour's kip. So, amnesia. A lot of people can... Sorry, ah, not amnesia. <laughs> that is amnesia. <laughs> Insomnia <laughs> is a common complaint, sleeplessness. A lot of people complain about it, and um, half the time they're imagining it, because uh, if you actually monitor their sleep in a laboratory, you find that they're getting about as much sleep as, as anybody else. Uh, just that uh, they find it more stressful to be awake. Um, particularly older people uh, who actually need less sleep but still feel as though they've got to lie in bed for, uh, for eight hours. Uh, now, sleeping pills, um, I've heard tw whoops, 12 million prescribed per year in the UK. Actually, uh, another figure I've heard is, is 18 million. Maybe, uh, maybe that figure didn't include Scotland. <laughs> or something, but, but anyway, an enormous number of, of so-called hypnotics, sleeping pills, get prescribed every year. And uh, it's not at all clear that it's a good idea, because they tend to be addictable, uh, and that includes most of the major groups, barbiturates, they used to use benzodiazepines, which are minor tranquilizers. Z drugs are any drug that, where the, the name starts with Z. Uh, quite a few, few of them. And melatonin, as I mentioned, has been used to cure sleeplessness. Um, some people have, some researchers have found that they tend to interfere with the most essential aspects of sleep, the deep sleep and uh, REM sleep. And hence they will tend ultimately to lead to fatigue and impairment of memory has been recorded. Other researchers find that they're linked to cancer and almost anything is, if you read the Daily Mail, mind you, um, Alzheimer's disease and uh, higher mortality. And you can't have a worse side effect than death, can you really? <laughs> uh, more than that, there seem to be minimal gains in actual sleep. Uh, on average, they give you, f you go to sleep 15 minutes faster if you're taking sleeping pills and uh, for half an hour longer. Um, more than that, it seems that half of the effect of sleeping pills is down to placebo. You might be better off just taking the placebos. <laughs> so how should you go about uh, dealing with insomnia? Well, th this is the sort of advice that sleep clinics are typically dishing out at the moment. That you, first of all, you should use the bedroom only for sleeping uh, and perhaps sex, <laughs> um, whether or not you've got a partner. And uh, yeah, no eating, drinking, or especially working. That is, you've got to get rid of all the office equipment, computers, particularly the screens that emit light, because they will confuse your biological clock. Make sure it's cool, quiet, and dark. Uh, try to keep regular sleep and waking times. In fact, wake up at the same time, regardless of what time you went to bed, is advice that's often given. Get plenty of physical exercise in the daytime if you can, uh, not too close to bedtime. Avoid, obviously, stimulants like caffeine, but also alcohol, um, because it works a little bit like uh, the sleeping pills. It'll, you'll go out like a light, all right, but you won't get the, the restful aspects of sleep. You'll be missing some components of the sleep cycle. 
Other thing is, if you can't get to sleep, don't lie there sweating it and worrying about it. You're better to actually get up and do something until you are properly tired and then go back to bed. Uh, because, as I say, eight hours may not be required by everybody. Uh, so a lot of older people need less. Other thing is that if you are anxious or depressed, uh, you've got to worry about something, it's better to address the problem. Get up and write a letter to the person that uh, owes you money or the, uh, to the people who are demanding that you pay your traffic fine or whatever it is that is disturbing you. Go, try and sort it out and then go back to bed. And if all else fails, then go and have... Uh, Cognitive behaviour therapy seems to be the, the most constructive approach to therapy. Sleep apnea is a, a sleep disorder in which your breathing is interrupted during sleep, um, which is more disturbing to the partner than to the sleeper, who usually remembers nothing about it in the morning. But uh, they are getting fatigued, they are showing sleepiness in the daytime, uh, bad temper, accident proneness, and their immune system is depressed. Uh, a few cases are brain-based. Uh, more often, it's obstructive. There is an obstruction in the back of the throat, uh, a tendency to relaxation in the throat, um, that it is associated with snoring also, um, also distressing to the partner perhaps. Um, the various approaches to treatment include avoiding alcohol and sleeping pills, losing weight. Um, there are various oral devices that are available that can maintain um, open airways, although many people find them a, a little bit, um, I don't know, disturbing <laughs> to, to try sleeping with them and uh, possibly surgery, in, particularly in the cases of central sleep apnea. Other researchers have said that the singing and, and playing of musical instruments is good for your breathing. Uh, some research has used the didgeridoo, which apparently is uh, a good way of building strength in your throat muscles and hence reducing the likelihood of ap sleep apnea. Narcolepsy is more or less the opposite of insomnia. I suppose the tendency to be drowsy in the daytime and to uh, suddenly fall asleep uh, at inconvenient times in the middle of the day. Uh, it's sometimes said that if the audience at a lecture falls asleep, that's perfectly normal. But if the lecturer falls asleep, that's narcolepsy. <laughs> um, Apparently, it is an intrusion of uh, REM sleep into uh, daytime activity. And it will carry with it um, muscle paralysis and probably some vivid dreams. In fact, the, the condition of cataplexy is uh, a very sudden muscular weakness in which you would just sort of collapse on the floor. And it seems to be uh, brought on by strong emotion and nobody is quite sure why. Or at least I'm not quite sure why. Uh, narcolepsy has a heritable component to it. Uh, very occasionally it's linked with head injury. And it is treated by different drugs. Um, stimulants and uh, SSRIs are serotonin boosting antidepressants. Um, Taking controlled naps in the daytime might help if you uh, have that possibility available to you. On to uh, the question of dreams. As I say, everybody dreams, though not everybody remembers it. The people who claim that they don't dream ever, about 6% of the population, if uh, woken in uh, REM sleep uh, in a sleep lab, will say, oh yes, I, as a matter of fact, I was having a dream. <laughs> I was thinking about this. Uh, now, they tend to be highly visual, uh, highly emotional. Anxiety and abandonment are two of the most common emotions, but uh, there are positive emotions like joy as well. They will often refer to events either from the day uh, 
I said previous day, I think I might mean the, the day before you go to sleep. Uh, or one week previously. There are, there are peaks at those two points. Background stimuli tend to be incorporated into the dream. If the door doorbell rings, somebody is coming to visit you in your dreams. Probably not the person who's actually ringing the doorbell. Um, music will be incorporated so that you imagine that you're at a party scene, perhaps. Uh, if water is sprayed on a sleeping individual, they're likely to, to dream that it's uh, raining. They're outside and the rain is starting. Of course, uh, dreams are surrealistic. They, they tend to morph from one situation to another. The laws of physics don't apply. You may be able to fly in your dreams, which you can't normally do, <laughs> uh, unless you're an advanced Scientologist or something. Um, they tend to be symbolic and metaphorical. Um, and you, yourself, is, is always at the center of the action, but uh, having remarkably little control over it. That is, we are there, but things are happening to us rather than us controlling the sequence of events. Except in the case of what are called lucid dreams where you become conscious of the fact that you are dreaming. And uh, some, this happens to some people more than others. It can be a learned capacity. Some people claim to be able to harness it for creative purposes or for um, treating their distressing recurrent nightmares. Uh, but uh, lucid dreamers do have a bit more control over the... Um, direction of the narrative. If you know you're dreaming, you can control the events a little bit more effectively. Um, when disabled people dream, they tend not to be disabled in the dream. Uh, paraplegics can walk. Uh, deaf mutes talk and sing quite normally. Um, now, it's not qu quite clear whether this is some kind of genetic program uh, that is um, unfolding or whether uh, the disabled people are copying able-bodied people um, using the, these mirror neurons, which is the method by which we can uh, you copy other people's behavior in our own. If people became blind before they were five years of age, they tend to dream without visual imagery. And they have little REM. So there's obviously a connection between rapid eye movement and the visual component of dreams. If people are colorblind, uh, obviously they dream only in the colors that they have experienced. And older people are more likely to report dreaming in black and white. <laughs> which is rather interesting because presumably the movies of their day and the television of their day was more likely to be in black and white and there is some sense in which uh, when they dream they, they think they are experiencing uh, these media of their um, prime era. Dreams can uh, solve problems and provide inspiration Presumably because they provide loose associations, which is one of the keys to creativity that I mentioned in an earlier lecture. And uh, some rather nice examples. The, this is the benzene ring, uh, the chemical structure of benzene with carbon and hydrogen. Um, and uh, this was apparently, the structure was inspired by a dream of a snake biting its tail by the discoverer of the benzene ring. It was a big thing in organic chemistry at the time. Um, the machine sewing needle, which has a hole near, uh, near its tip, apparently came out of a dream by this chap Elias Howe back in the Industrial Revolution days, a dream of cannibals uh, prancing about a pot with uh, notches towards the end of their spears. And he suddenly woke up and he had the idea of the machine sewing needle. 
The plot of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Stevenson claimed, came to him in a dream. He was quite annoyed about being woken up, apparently, when he had half the book written. <laughs> uh, and Mary Shelley uh, had a dream of bringing... She had a baby that died on her, and she dreamed of bringing it back to life. And uh, that inspired her novel, Frankenstein. Um, one of the, the great horror <laughs> themes of the century. Oh, and, and the two centuries that followed it. Uh, Paul McCartney claims that the song Yesterday came to him in a dream as well. Whether marijuana was uh, also inv involved in that, he didn't say. Now, dreams, of course, are famously full of symbolism. And uh, w one of the questions is why? Well, um, probably the simplest answer is that symbolism is actually a fairly primitive kind of thought. It's pictorial and, and metaphorical, um, whereas um, more advanced kinds of thought involve mathematics and words. But uh, the question is why uh, um, do, does symbolism play some other role? And Sigmund Freud... Uh, famously reckoned that the purpose of symbolism was to disguise the meaning of the dream from the dreamer because um, it was expressing unconscious desires that they did not wish to be made aware of or reminded of. And so they used symbols to disguise them. Uh, there's a bit of a problem with that, is that um, a person who dreams of a train running through a, a tunnel that Freud would in interpret uh, as sexual intercourse, on other occasions actually dreams of sexual intercourse. Same person, same dreamer. So it's a bit hard to imagine why uh, that individual would um, want to dream in disguised language on, on one occasion and rather directly of the same event on another. Well, my mentor, Hans Eysenck, wrote a book called Sense and Nonsense in, in Psychology that I read when I was fairly young and uh, was much impressed by. And, of course, uh, Freud's theory of dreams was, part, was on the nonsense side of the equation. He said that the function of symbolism is actually adjectival. It's to uh, make clearer the, the meaning uh, and put a, uh, a slant on it. So that, uh, for example, you may dream of your mother as a cow or a queen depending on whether you are thinking of her nutritive aspects or her um, disciplinarian function. Uh, and interestingly, the, the Greeks were very much aware of, of symbols. Everybody has known about symbols. There are biblical dreams and so on in which the symbols are interpreted. Uh, so it, it wasn't a new idea in Freud, the idea of interpreting symbols. But the Greeks uh, were more likely to go the other way. That is, something overtly sexual would be seen as symbolic of, of a non-sexual event. If you dream of sleeping with your mother, you know what uh, Freud would think about that, or he would actually he would say you wouldn't dream of sleeping with your mother because you'd have some disguised way of doing it. But the Greeks would say that means that your mother is about to bestow some exceptional honour upon you. Now, uh, uh, there have been a number of more modern theories uh, of dreams flying around. Um, one is called the activation synthesis uh, hypothesis of uh, Hobson and Macaulay. And they reckon that um, dreams occur in REM sleep, and REM sleep occurs when the pons, uh, an area in the brain stem, uh, becomes active. This is the, the second... Uh, biological oscillator that I mentioned earlier. And it has several effects. One is to um, induce muscular paralysis. Another is to activate various other areas of the brain. Another is to cause uh, rapid eye movements. And Hobson and company reckon that the dreams are simply the forebrain's attempt to impose meaning 
upon the random sensations that are being produced by the firing of the pons into other parts of the brain. Depending, it'll move around, it'll morph from one uh, experience to another depending on uh, where those neurons are firing. And if they're going into an emotional area of the brain like the amygdala, activating that, then you will experience fear and you will try to rationalize the fear by thinking, oh yes, I had an accident uh, a few days ago and, and uh, that will come to your mind to account for the experience of fear that has been induced by the random firing of the ponds in that, at that particular target. Now the critics of Hobson say that uh, dreams are not actually random. They follow continuous storylines. Um, and uh, I suppose r rather more uh, telling is that lesions to the brainstem don't seem to prevent dreams from happening. Although if you lose your parietal lobes, uh, damage to those will damage your capacity to dream. Another theory that's been around uh, for some time uh, was first suggested by Newman and Evans. Christopher Evans was an English psychologist who was way ahead of his time because uh, computers were fairly primitive when he began to use them as a model for dreams. But what he was saying is that dreams are the experiential byproduct of uh, the offline brain uh, sorting experiences from the day, discarding the junk that you don't need to bother with again, and uh, placing material that will have future relevance into appropriate files uh, where it can be associated with uh, other experiences and can be re-accessed when necessary in your, in your life. And uh, if that is the case, um, then of course that would account for the fact that we have difficulty remembering our dreams because your dreams are in themselves a memory consolidation process. And uh, as, as I said earlier, one of the functions of sleep has made it uh, plain that we do need sleep to consolidate our memories. Over only the, um, it seems as though the stage two period of sleep spindles may be more critical to consolidation than uh, dreaming, which occurs in REM sleep. Uh, maybe both uh, are ne necessary in different aspects of laying down permanent memories. The continuity theory of dreaming uh, points up some of the parallels that occur between waking thought and dreaming. They are similar in very many respects. Um, they maintain, that is the, mainly Kelvin Hall and his colleagues, maintain that we have exaggerated the extent to which dreams are bizarre. For the most part, they just reflect... Uh, waking concerns about the past, the present, and the future. The things that trouble us in real life are the things that trouble us in our dreams. I don't know if you're familiar with the nightmare song from Iolanthe, but uh, the Lord Chancellor says that love unrequited robs me of my rest. Um, and, uh, and he interprets his dreams as being due to unrequited love. But if you analyze the, the nightmare song, uh, everything that is bothering him uh, was probably also bothering W.S. Gilbert and appearing in his dreams, and is the typical kind of stuff that would bother a, a middle-aged, uh, middle-class man uh, in Victorian days, in, including Gilbert himself. Uh, he's concerned about um, the stress of public transport, this is if you read through the nightmare song or can re recall it. Uh, he's got friends and relatives who are leeching off him and bothering him. He's got um, business rivals. His, um, uh, he's got concern about investments that, that have gone sour. <laughs> and uh, his uh, attorney uh, turns out to be very immature. He is, appears in the dream as an 11-year-old boy. 
So, <laughs> so obviously the, the sorts of things that uh, are bothering Gilbert and that appear in the Lord Chancellor's nightmare song are um, concerns about ongoing life and uh, uh, certainly don't seem to be uh, replete with the sexual symbolism that, uh, that Freud would have been looking for uh, a, dec a decade or two later than the Nightmare Song was written. According to this chap, Dumhoff, who is uh, in this continuity theory camp, uh, dreams arise from a neural subsystem in the limbic uh, that's the emotional brain, paralympic, and the associational forebrain just outside of that. And um, these are areas that are active in mind wandering and daydreaming, sort of dreamlike uh, experiences that occur in the daytime, uh, very much like the sort of things that you have in your dreams. And, and he talks about um, a waking default network, he calls it. Um, and uh, lesions to that network will have similar effects on both your waking thought patterns, your imagination and your daydreams, as they will on your dreams. Uh, it's the default network because it is uh, what is going on when your mind is wandering rather than being directed uh, in an attentional kind of way by pressing matters and processing environmental input. Now, uh, another suggestion has been that um, nightmares are a way, uh, a sort of a virtual reality situation in which you can practice coping with the dreadful things which uh, uh, have occurred to you and might occur to you in real life. So they are tryouts, they are rehearsals. And uh, the same reason why you might go to see horror movies. You'd like to uh, practice your coping strategies. What would I do if this happened to me in, in real life? And it's perhaps significant that um, a high proportion of dreams, about 80% of dreams, according to these researchers, uh, include threatening narratives of one sort or another. Not necessarily full-blown nightmares, but some kind of a threat that you have to deal with in the dream and that uh, you ultimately might have to deal with in real life. <coughs> now, an interesting question is what happened to people's dreams after the events of 9-11? Uh, was one of these cases where the, the dream analysts were keen to see whether it would appear in the dreams. And uh, apparently no... In this guy's research, Hartman, there were no direct replays of the events, no aeroplanes, tall buildings uh, appearing in the dreams. Uh, in fact, I suppose, um, if you were uh, to follow the psychoanalytic argument, maybe you wouldn't expect them. Maybe you'd expect them to be repressed and uh, into something so obscure that you didn't even realize it had anything to do with 9-11. But uh, what Hartman did find was that the central images of the dreams that did occur were emotionally more intense than they had been previously. He'd been measuring the emotional intensity of the dreams in these people running up to 9-11 and the same group of people afterwards. And he found that there was an increased emotional charge to the dreams that they were having, even though they were not about 9-11. Uh, so, obviously, insecurity, general insecurity can feed into your dreams, but your dreams will probably remain more personal and idiosyncratic than a simple replay of horrible events occurring in your environment. Now, um, men tend to wake up in the morning with an erection. And if they don't, that, that's a sign uh, that if they are sexually dysfunctional, it is uh, of a physiological origin rather than psychogenic. Uh, so that you can actually test this with a, a so-called snap gauge, which is like putting a very um, fragile rubber band 
uh, around your weapon, and if it snaps, uh, then, then uh, an erection has been enjoyed in, in the night. If it doesn't, uh, you might have uh, physiological problems that they might have to deal with. Um, now, of course, these erections and the equivalent occurring in, in women um, occur in REM sleep, particularly the REM sleep towards wake, the waking phase in the morning, and they're not due to sexual dreams, as psychoanalysts might have believed. They are a direct re result of the par general paralysis that uh, is being signaled from your brain. They may, however, increase the likelihood uh, of sexual content in your dreams. They may increase the likelihood of having wet dreams. But uh, it's still interesting that um, only about 8% of dreams are sexual, which would be, a, a, again, a, a disappointment uh, to Freud and, and his colleagues, perhaps. What does uh, the use of pornography do to your dreams? Uh, well, one thing this research shows is that uh, the content of erotic dreams tends to mirror your daytime interests. We dream about the same things that we fantasize about uh, and, and indeed like to do if we have half a chance. Uh, so in that sense, um, the work on erotic dreams follows the continuity theory, the similarity between uh, daytime fantasies, daydreaming, and uh, the content of your erotic dreams. Now, higher consumption of pornography tends to be linked to female domination scenarios. Uh, I suppose that might tell you something about the kind of people that use uh, a lot of porn. They tend to be the kind of man that likes uh, female domination themes. Uh, particularly those that involve celebrities and female authority figures, things like police officers and teachers and so on. Uh, I don't know if you know this lady, she's a compatriot of mine, Lucy Lawless, who appeared as Xena Princess Warrior and uh, um, Lucia in uh, what's that gladiator thing? Um, Spartacus. <laughs> yeah. If you are having sexual release in the daytime, whether through pornography or with a partner or anything else, you will, are less likely to have a wet dream at night. That follows, I suppose. Uh, but it, makes, uh, it would suggest that the frequency of wet dreams in uh, monasteries is, uh, is way up by comparison with the, the rest of the population. Now, some interesting things take place in sleep that are not in REM sleep, so much as non-REM sleep phenomena. One is obviously sleepwalking, which occurs in about 4% of people. And uh, usually they don't come to, to much harm. They'll find their way back to bed and not particularly bump over the furniture. Occasionally they'll fall out an upstairs window or something, but it's, it's pretty rare. Um, it's not true that you shouldn't wake up a sleepwalker, incidentally. It w uh, nothing dreadful will happen to them, except that they will seem terribly confused, not know where they are. might be slightly distressing to them, but they won't uh, die or anything horrible like that. Um, some people have s sex in their sleep. Uh, again, it occurs, it um, tends to be about as rare as sleepwalking. It is often loveless and uh, rather aggressive as a style of sex. Some people grind their teeth, call out, raid the get up and raid the refrigerator if, <laughs> if they're on a very severe diet, uh, or assault their partner. And um, these are things that are occurring in deep sleep, occasionally REM or the fringes of waking, um, the individual has no recollection of them or memory for th that event in the night when they wake up. Their eyes tend to be open and staring, but not 
really processing or seeing. And these phenomena tend to occur in connection with extreme tiredness, alcohol consumption, stress, apnea, and a family history of such, such things are all correlated uh, activities. Now, um, being asleep has occasionally been used uh, as a defense against rape. It's not all that easy to substantiate, but nevertheless, uh, of um, 18 UK cases, 12 ended in acquittal, and rather interestingly, 14 of them had involved alcohol as well. Um, this chap, Brian Thomas, was actually acquitted of murdering his wife, Christine, while he was asleep. Uh, this occurred at 3 a.m. in the morning, and at the time, he was, said he was having a nightmare in which he was defending the caravan in which they were sleeping uh, against a boy racer who was attacking him, probably somebody he'd seen in the daytime. Uh, the judge decided that he was a decent man and devoted husband, and uh, the court accepted that he was not in control of his behavior, and he was therefore acquitted of murder. Um, I don't recommend that you kill your spouse and, and try this on <laughs> because uh, the experts have a few subtle ways of, uh, of telling that it's a bluff. Uh, here's another interesting case. This girl, Becky Mason, uh, drove five miles to work in her pajamas on a Saturday night, um, three times over the alcohol limit, and she crashed her car uh, on the way back home after being turned away by the security guard who said, sorry, the, uh, the place is closed and you're not expected till Monday morning. Um, again, she was cleared by this Liverpool court uh, on the basis of expert opinion that she was asleep at the time she crashed the car three times over the limit, and hence not responsible. And uh, the defense obviously was based on the security guard's testimony as to what happened, uh, plus a family history of parasomnia. And finally, uh, the phenomenon of sleep paralysis, which um, again is, is rather rare, but uh, some of you may have experienced it. Um, there, there is quite a common nightmare of an evil presence pressing down upon you. Uh, or sitting on you in the bed. Um, you can call it the go a ghost or an incubus. Uh, and um, it is ab very disturbing to the person who experiences it. Uh, and uh, another common nightmare, of course, is being unable to run away from something that is pursuing you. Now, um, both of those things may be more understandable when we realize that uh, our limbs are effectively paralyzed during REM sleep, quite possibly to prevent you from acting out the things that you are dreaming. But if you become half awake while having one of these nightmares, then uh, you will believe that it is actually happening, that this is something real that is happening to you, and it may get interpreted in various ways. It may uh, be responsible for some reports of rape, uh, child abuse, astral projections perhaps, and alien abductions may be uh, down to this sleep paralysis phenomenon, which uh, is somewhere between waking and REM sleep and hence seems incredibly real. So the next time you wake up and you've got an incubus sitting on you uh, on your bed, the chances are that you are experiencing sleep paralysis. So um, I don't think that uh, I've necessarily solved all the mysteries of sleep and dreams for you. In fact, you're probably even more confused than you were before I began. <laughs> but it's a difficult field and we're just uh, beginning to... Uh, to make some inroads. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.